Okay, I'm sure many of you have heard of YOLO. You look only once. And with one stage detectors, you're more going after efficiency. You want your detector to be real time compared to two stage detectors. With two stage detectors, you started with something that you want it to be very accurate. With one stage detectors, you want to start with something that is very efficient. You want it to be real time. And by the end of these slides, when I finish all of them, you're gonna see that the two methods are actually converging to each other but they are approaching the same problem from two different perspectives. One is from the perspective of efficiency. The other one is from the perspective of accuracy. So it's going to have three stages. You're low. It's going to have you first resize your image, then you run your convolutional network, and then you do your non-max operation. So this is the key figure in the paper. So you start with a S by S grid on your input image. You have S regions here, S bins there, then what your network is going to do is going to predict the bounding boxes and the corresponding confidence. You're going to have a classifier per each region, which is a class probability map. And the plot that I'm showing is for both of them, is for inference. We don't worry about training for now. If you have that, bounding boxes plus their confidence. And if you know the class probability map, you can multiply them together and pick the most uh, probable bounding boxes and just report them. So you just multiply this by that, and that's going to give you a final detection. And this is happening during inference. So let's see a little bit of the math behind it. You divide your input image into S by S. Now we want to see what is our training data. If the center of one of your ground truth objects falls into a cell, that cell is going to be a positive it's going to be responsible for detecting that object. So that's how you're going to, that's the rule that you're going to use to define your training data. If the box for this dot, if its center falls within, let's say, this cell, that cell is going to be responsible for detecting that dot. Each cell is going to predict B bounding boxes, and B is two in this case. So it's going to predict two bounding boxes and a corresponding confidence score. So what is the confidence score? At least what is the training data for it? It's the probability of the object times the intersection over unit of ground truth and the predicted uh, bounding box. So that's what the network is going to output. It's going to output the confidence. So what does this mean? What does the conf confidence mean? It means how confident your model is that this box, let's say the box that is uh, responsible for the dot contains a dot, contains any object, an object. So it doesn't have to be a dot, it could be any object. And at the same time, it's a measure of how accurate it thinks the box is because of the intersection over unit. So that's the confidence. First, it tells us that there is an object. What is the probability that there is an object? And at the same time, how accurate the box is. So that's the confidence score. Now we want to go towards the regression part. You have the center of the box, and that's going to be X and Y. And these are really important. This is relative, X and Y is relative to the bounds of the grid cell. So if your cell is defining your coordinate system, then in that coordinate system, you are defining X and Y. So X and Y is a pixel in this coordinate system. But W and H, they are relative to the entire image. So they are in the scales of the entire image. And then each grid cell, not only it's going to predict the bounding boxes and the confidence, it's going to predict the class probability map. And it's just the way you interpret it is that if there is an object, condition on there being an object, what class that is. I know that there is an object in this region or in this uh, cell. If I know that there is an object, what is its class? What is the probability of it being a dot? So if you interpret these predictions this way, this way, and then you can multiply the confidence by the class probability map. This is the confidence. This is the class probability. And then you're going to end up with the class specific confidence score. This one is exactly the class being a dot, not any other object. So what is your network structure in the end? Your network is going to output a tensor. It's going to take an in input image, and it's going to output S by S, and they correspond to these grids. It's going to output B boxes. Each box is going to have its coordinates 
X, Y, W, and H, and then a confidence. That's where you get this pi, and then it's gonna output C classes, C conditional class property, and that corresponds to each one of these classes. For now, it's a red, but during training, it could have been anything. It could be any of those C classes. So that's what your network is outputting. Okay. Now we know our, what is our data. We know what is our model. Now we need to know how to train it. And the training is just regression based. Everything is regression, mean squared error. You have your XI. This is the ground truth. This is the prediction of the model and that corresponds to the center. You have YI, Y hat I. These are the ground truth minus the prediction. Then you are doing it for all of these S by S grid or all of the grid points in your grid. You're gonna have a squared of them. Then you're gonna have B boxes per each grid. And then one IJ of object is gonna tell you, is there an object? This is condition on there being an object in the I cell and the B box corresponding to that cell. And there are only two boxes per each cell. And if it doesn't exist, you just don't plan analyze it. So that doesn't include in your loss. Okay, that's for the X and Y, for the center of your box. For the width and height, you need to, you could do WI minus WI hat, but then your algorithm is not gonna converge. The reason is small changes to big boxes are, you need to be less sensitive to them, to small changes on smaller boxes. And this is square root is gonna try to do that. It's not perfect, but it's trying to do that. So a change on a big box is a different, is a smaller change compared to the same change on a smaller box. Okay, then you have that if there is an object in there, that term is gonna be included in your objective function. Then if there is an object, there is a class corresponding to it. And this is your confidence because it is being interpreted as a confidence not as a probability, you can use a regression loss. Otherwise, you would need to do cross entropy. But now, because these are confidence predictions, you just do that. And this is condition on there being an object. This is condition on no object. It means being background. So you're gonna have a prediction for your background as well. And what else is left? Then you need, it, you need to do another regression for these class probabilities. You could do, a cross entropy loss, but you might as well use the mean squared loss. This is per each class because you know that per each grid, you're going to have a vector. And C is just picking out that entry of the vector. And then that's going to help you do a regression on this class probability. That's your entire loss. If lambda coordinate, lambda coordinate, and lambda no object are all equal to one, your algorithm is not going to converge. Why is the reason? The reason is that there are a lot of negative examples. There are a lot of boxes with no objects, background that you don't care about. But if you add them all together, then your loss is going to be tilted toward those negative objects, the ones that you don't want to detect. So what you do is you reduce this value and then increase the other one. So the other one is five. This is just to try to balance the scales of these loss and how important they are compared to each other. What is the trade-off between doing a regression on the coordinates versus some object that don't exist, the background. If you don't do this, this term is gonna dominate because you have a lot of them. And then, as I said, you have two bucks per your grid, per each grid, and then you have 20 classes because that is Pascal DLC. And this term I explained. If, if an object appears in cell I, this indicator function is one, otherwise it's zero. And this other term denotes that the J bounding box predictor in cell I is responsible for that prediction. So this is where you're training data and how do you identify what is positive and negative is coming into picture. And the way that you do it, you look at the intersection over unit. Okay, let's take a look at, you saved a lot when you do YOLO, but what did you miss? So the amount of Box is being predicted correctly. So it reduced from 71.6 to 65.5. But then something interesting happens. Your network is making less errors for the background class. It turns out that faster CNN is making a lot of errors for the background. It's identifying something on the background that doesn't exist. It's just background. Okay. I think we are finishing right on time.
So if those of you have questions, you can stay and ask. And the ones who want to leave, you can leave. I'll be around. So this um the C sub I is that the class score? Yes. So C sub I is the class score. And then how does that work for the confidence for each grid or each box? You have a confidence. Okay. And then when you have the no object, why does your class score show up in that loss? Uh, this part. Yeah. Because you are still predicting a value for yourself and your box, but that could be a background. These are where you put your negative. If you include only positive examples, then your network is not training at all because it needs to see all what is a good, it needs to be penalized when it's making mistakes. And then you need to know what is a mistake. You need to tell your network what is a mistake. That's why the negative examples matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then are we going to spend uh, more, because we still don't know really how forward pass is, is done. Um, so is there another like class on this uh, network or uh, like, what, what do you mean? Like, how do we get our, uh, how do we do a, like, what's the architecture for generating these uh, bounding boxes? Oh, yes, they are using uh, Darknet, but uh, that one I'm going to show you in the last slide. It's going to be okay. in the low version three. I'm going to use that slide to give you the architecture. Okay, cool. But uh, for this paper, what mattered was uh, the objective function, which is all regression based, and how you design your network, which is not that hard. You can have any, any convolutional neural network, and then in the end, you're outputting these many numbers. I see. Yeah, because I'd, I'd always confuse Darknet and YOLO, but I guess YOLO is sort of built on top of Darknet, um, and it has a special loss. Uh, YOLO has a special loss, yes. And the other one is uh, it's a single stage detector. And, uh, and the idea is this sliding window. So you have boxes that are being slid over your image. Mm -hmm. So there cool. is no region proposal network. And, uh, yes. And the last function. And the last function, you are flexible. You can change it. Yeah. And then, so going back to the, the S by S grid, so each, just to make sure I have this down, each grid or each cell inside that grid generates two bounding boxes. But that bounding box can extend outside of, like looking just at this picture, like the bounding box can be bigger than the, the actual cell, right? Exactly. So X and Y, the center of the boxes are in the coordinate of the grid cell, but W and H could be as big as the entire image. Right. So yes. multiple cells may uh, may output the same bounding box. Yes. When it comes to prediction, yes. But during training, that's why you have this one of objective and mm. one of object. I see. That's when the training is done. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye.